Barry Hansen. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Engineering for the Technology Management Program and also a faculty member in the Mechanical Engineering Department. The uh, Technology Management Program is a rather unique instrument uh, and I think it exists because of the foresight of this campus and the strong leadership. Matt Terrell, who the Chancellor introduced, talked about fundraising and leadership. Uh, but this program exists because uh, he's made it exist. And it doesn't exist on many other campuses. Uh, most of you have attended leading universities uh, and uh, participated actively in their activities. Uh, a great college of engineering teaches a great deal about analytical thinking, engineering tools, the principles. Uh, people come out able to solve technical problems extremely well, but in very few of those institutions do they actually get an opportunity to understand how their skill set and the types of problems they will be solving affect and the organization that they will be part of and particularly the issue of how one can bring those new technologies to the marketplace. On most of these university campuses there are schools of business. I'm a product of that channel of education, a leading university, and I learned a great deal about management structures and marketing and the disciplines of business, but I had almost no encounter with the difficulties of making critical business decisions about uncertain technological developments. On this campus, housed within the College of Engineering is the Technology Management Program, which straddles both the shortcomings and emphasizes the strengths of those two sort of great development paths. And the opportunity then is for students within the engineering and sciences to gain a business discipline with an orientation about how do we bring new products to market, how do we create wealth in society. And for those across the social sciences on campus, they have an opportunity to interact and work with the technologist and learn how they can be a part of this process of technological development and commercialization. In addition to the curriculum, there are a number of extracurricular activities, and that's really the focus of this particular opportunity that we have over the next two days. How can we, as an institution, contribute to a societal problem or question or challenge? one that requires business acumen, political skills, technical skills, policy skills. Can we help advance knowledge and help in the process of bringing new products to market by bringing together experts from across the necessary disciplines and perspectives relative to the energy issue? This is our second attempt to do so based on the success of the first. The mission then is to take an unbiased look at how our nation makes the transition from dependency on carbon-based fuels to a sustainable alternative fuels-based future. To present current and emergent technologies for short and long-term solutions to world needs with an additional fo focus on the social, economic, political factors which enable or instruct their adaptation. I hope you all have a program in front of you. The, um, uh, I had the opportunity of actually attending Professor Lay's uh, 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 climate uh, talk um, with our guest uh, James Hansen on, uh, I think was it Wednesday night, Tuesday night, which had a huge turnout. And I watched him do this masterful introduction of a, of a great speaker. And I thought to myself, well, there's a challenge because he clearly knows his field, he knows this individual intimately well, and, and uh, by the time the speaker got up, I really had a context in which to put him. I sort of put that uh, in terms of MC skill level, compare that to a, another episodes which we'll see shortly, which we're all familiar with, which is the uh, Academy Awards, where you watch people that seem to know very little about anything uh, give these awards out, and then people come on and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything. And uh, it's occurred to me that uh, I couldn't do the latter. And the former would be quite difficult given that we have over 32 speakers coming from around the world for this event. I actually sort of timed it out. I figured if I give a proper introduction for every speaker, uh, we'd have about two hours left for the actual speakers to make their contributions. So we have prepared the program so that it has much more of the backgrounds about in the individual speakers in them, and I encourage you to look there. I will simply be using name and titles, and please know that when I use that, I'm 
putting behind it all the honor that is appropriate for the different individuals that we're talking about. What I'm going to try to do in my time is lay out a framework that I hope will be helpful for the rest of the conference and at least will force people to adhere to some basic ground rules in discussing energy because when you see these energy discussions in public policy, they often confuse topics and confuse issues in ways that confuse where we really have to go. So let me start by pointing out we have two energy challenges, sources and storage, and those are very distinct challenges. Hydrogen is in no way a solution to the first challenge. When people talk about hydrogen, they're talking about a storage mechanism. Hydrogen is not a source of energy. It can be used as a very convenient source of storage of energy for transportation. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The sources we have energy are fossil fuels, nuclear reactions, and various forms of solar and wind power, including solar energy that's stored in plant life, solar energy, the, and uh, that, uh, well, the uh, energy created from waves and so forth. We often hear people, when they're talking about the energy crisis, discuss, or the energy issues, discuss storage technologies rather than the energy source. They, people talk about hydrogen, people talk about fuel cells as a solution. These are not solutions to the energy source problem. They are potentially solutions to the energy storage problem, which is potentially an important part of the issue. Hydroelectric power is a source of storage. It turns out refined petroleum products are a fabulous store, form of storage of energy. There's a very high degree of energy for the weight and volume in a gallon of gasoline, and that is why it is such a great fuel for transportation. You can carry it around with you. So far, we haven't found something that replaces that very effectively. The main place we run into this storage technology problem is, of course, in transportation fuels. Stationary fuels we can put on a grid, we can connect a wire, and we can figure out how to generate the power somewhere else. As a result, for the most part, that's not entirely true, but to a great extent, storage is less of an issue. Storage still becomes an issue, even with stationary, when we have external forms of energy that appear whenever they like, particularly wind power. Solar power, by the way, also appears whenever it likes, but it tends to appear at the right time in terms of our demand for electricity. Wind power tends to appear at the wrong time, and so storage technologies really matter. Solving the storage problem is first and foremost solving the energy transportation problem, but it also applies to a certain extent to solving the grid problem when we start talking about renewable energy. When we talk about the source problem, there are three very distinct problems that we face. And it is critical to understand that those pro and understand and not confuse those three problems. First, there's a cost-efficient supply problem. That is, we want it to be cheap because we want to be able to use a lot of it, and we want plentiful supplies. Oil has done that for a long time. Fossil fuels have done that more generally for a long time. I'm going to come back in a moment and tell you that that's going to be true well into your grandchildren's lives. That is not a problem. Environmental effects are obviously an issue. Greenhouse gas emissions are becoming recognized as probably the greatest threat facing the world today. And geopolitical problems that grow from energy use. Uh, a recognition that when we use oil, sure, Exxon makes $20 billion a year, but that doesn't really bother me. What bothers me is when Iran is pulling in an extra 30 to $40 billion a year, as they are right now, with prices at $60 a barrel, rather than where the futures market said they would be today at the beginning of 2003, which was around $23 a barrel. That difference is handing Iran an extra 30 to $40 billion a year. If you want to know why Iran can finance Hamas and Hezbollah and all sorts of disruption in the Middle East, that's it. And the, the now cliche phrase that we are financing both sides of the war on terror is completely accurate. To understand that, though, we have to understand the extent of the market. 
So we have to stop saying things like, we will reduce our imports of oil from the Middle East, or the problem is foreign oil. The problem is not foreign oil, the problem is oil. There is one oil market, none of it is yours. None of it. When the United States discovered oil in the Gulf of Mexico, the United States did not discover oil. Chevron discovered oil, and they had two partners, one of which was Stad Oil in Norway, and I've forgotten the other is an oil company I, most of you probably haven't heard of. Um, and the shareholders of those companies certainly were wealthier, but you were no wealthier, let, except to the extent you owned uh, stock in those companies. It isn't your oil. It is your oil when you're ready to pay for it at the world price, because that's what it's going to be sold for. But understanding that is really critical to understanding the geopolitics of energy. So let me go back to the cost efficient supply. If we are willing to just look at the direct costs of energy, to ignore the geopolitical costs, to ignore the environmental costs, there is one very simple answer to the energy problem. There is no problem. If you are willing to live with the current level of oil prices, you can have all the oil you want. Coal to liquids can be produced at about the current level of oil prices. And there is plenty of coal. And there is plenty of coal in the United States. So we do not face a cost-efficient energy supply problem. Unless we are worried about the environmental consequences or the geopolitical consequences, that's not an issue. Now let me point out, what if we are worried about the political consequences? It's still not an issue because the coal is here. We would not be enriching the, company, the countries that we are currently enriching if there was more coal production. If we really wanted to solve this problem, we could solve this problem if it was just a geopolitical problem by massively reducing our, the United States, consumption of oil, which we could do at fairly low cost, not tomorrow, but over the next few, couple of decades, by switching to coal to liquids. Now, that's a great idea if you're not worried about environmental issues, but on an environmental basis, whether it's coal to, li coal to liquids or synthetic fuel from the tar sands, it is a massive carbon producer, and so it doesn't solve the environmental issue. And fundamentally, when we start talking about energy and the current what I would say is a crisis in energy policy. It is a crisis about environmental issues. That, I would say, is fundamentally the issue we face and the question we face. And I think that comes down to the question of what value are we willing to put on reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And so far, implicitly, from U.S. policy, the answer is pretty much zero. Even the incredibly low prices uh, for gr tradable greenhouse gas emissions in Europe right now are considered unacceptable in the United States. And as long as that's the case, we're not going to do anything on environmental policy until we are willing to ramp up the, pri the implicit or explicit price we're willing to pay for greenhouse gas emissions, nothing is going to change. But that is the fundamental question. That's also the fundamental question for renewables. For any alternative energy, a bet on that alternative energy almost certainly comes down to a bet on U.S. public policy about greenhouse gases. Because if the U.S. does nothing about greenhouse gases, it is almost certainly the case that for many decades to come, and nobody invests real money for something that's further out than many decades, fossil fuels are going to be the cheapest source of energy around. And we are going to, quote, solve the current problem, not by developing wind power or solar or hydrogen or fuel cells, but by developing coal to liquids, by developing tar sand creation of oil equivalents, and by continuing to produce very large amounts of CO2. The experience from local pollution that we have with controlling pollutants is actually pretty positive if we decide to do it. 
we have made great progress in controlling NOx, SO2. We have a mercury program that's about to go into existence uh, with what's called a cap and trade program, where we cap the total amount and somehow allocate the rights to that, and that is always a very difficult political process. And then we allow all of the players in the market to trade. When I was in graduate school in the 1970s, this was considered this outrageous economist's idea that you could buy the right to pollute. Uh, this is actually one of the great successes of microeconomic contribution to public policy in our lifetime, that tradable permits have become recognized in the pollution area as a fabulous tool towards reaching any given goal. The downside is some people now confuse the notion of cap and trade or tradable permit systems with solving the problem. It is a mechanism for solving the problem. If you tell me what goal you want to reach, we can reach that goal through a tradable permit system in probably the most efficient way possible, but it's not going to tell you what the goal is. And if the goal has to be a serious goal for serious reduction, the costs are still going to be very, very significant. And this idea that we can solve this problem through using a tradable permit system misses the point. The point is that we can lessen the cost of meeting the goal, but unless we are going to set a very serious cap, we aren't going to make any progress. And if we do set a very serious cap, there's still going to be a high price to pay for greenhouse gas emissions, because the fact is we are emitting much more now then we can continue to emit if we're going to control climate change. And that means that somebody's got to emit a whole lot less. At the same time, the experience we've had from uh, the local pollutants, I think it has to give us a bit of pause when we try to graph that onto greenhouse gas emissions problems, because greenhouse gases are a global problem and the coordination required to solve that global problem is much greater than we've ever had to face before with any other pollutant. Either it's been local, like NOx or SO2, and so we've been able to control it purely within the U.S. in our case, or perhaps with a treaty across the Canadian border, or with the one primary exception, that is chlorofluorocarbons, which was a global pollutant that we had to control, but was just a vanishingly small part of, our, of the world economy, and it turned out to be pretty easy to replace. There was a very successful campaign in the 80s to replace CFCs with a worldwide treaty. The problem we face with greenhouse gas control is that it is fundamental to the economies all over the world not just ours and not just China that is held out as this boogeyman that's really some, in some sense the problem, but all developing countries and developed countries. And so everyone is going to have to make substantial changes. The problem with implementing a cap and trade program internationally that way is not the capping or the trading, it's the allocating the rights. And let me give you a perfectly uh, credible scenario at the first meeting of the International Association of Greenhouse Gas, Greenhouse Gas Emissions uh, Organization, where they are trying to allocate the rights. And the developing countries come in and they say the following. Well, we've done the following calculation. We looked up there in the atmosphere and we calculated how much of that stuff came from us and how much of that stuff came from you, the United States and developing countries. And we figure out the total amount that could be produced, including the stuff that's already produced, and we figured it, and we divide it up on a per capita basis, and guess what? You've already used all of yours. <laughs> In fact, even to use the amount you've already used, you have to buy some of our rights. So the only fair allocation is to give us everything, and you start buying it from us. And you know what? On an ethical ground, I think that they are on pretty firm footing with that. Um, we certainly have no sympathy for polluters in many other industries who have been, turn, have been spewing out something that turns out to be a highly toxic pollutant, 
And we now say, hey, we got to stop. And they say, well, wait a second. We have a right to continue the doing, polluting, so you better pay us to stop. We're usually not very sympathetic to that argument. But let's set aside that. Let's say instead that we all come to the table and we say, we'll let bygones be bygones. All the CO2 that's out there is out there. We'll divide up the going forward allocation of CO2 on a per capita basis. Guess what? We're still screwed. We're using most, we're producing most of the CO2. The developing countries on a per capita basis are producing very, very little. We still have to make massive wealth transfers to the developing world to get them to go along. And so this is going to be a real challenge. And as far as I can see it, the only two potential outcomes are either we actually make those wealth transfers or we engage in some sort of coercion slash colonialization to make sure we don't have to make those wealth transfers if you really want to control greenhouse gases. I'm ahead of Paul so far, aren't I? Uh, yes, this is more depressing than Paul's presentation. Um, let me say one more word about geopolitics, then I will wrap this up. Uh, it is true that geopolitics in the shorter run still play an important role. Um, we do have to understand the uh, extent of that role and the extent of the markets. Geopolitics do favor fossil fuels still, uh, just not oil. And they favor massive development of coal to liquids and massive development of the oil sands and so forth if you really don't care about greenhouse gases. Now, I do, and I think we should do something about it, but I think it's important to point that out and to point out, therefore, that uh, when we talk about the energy problem, we have to distinguish this. The Financial Times, generally considered a pretty good newspaper, had a headline a couple weeks ago after Bush's State of the Union address in which they said, Bush proposes doubling the size of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as part of his fight against global warming. <laughs> now, when the Financial Times can't figure out the difference between climate change and the geopolitics of oil, we've got a long ways to go. So where does that leave things? I think with a few narrow exceptions, Renewable energy is unlikely to be cost effective anytime soon. You're going to hear a lot of uh, presentations at this conference I th that will say we're getting there and we are getting there and they are getting more cost effective. But guess what? So is coal to liquids. So are the oil sands. That is, fossil fuel greenhouse gas emitting technologies are also getting more cost effective. And in that horse race, certainly for the next few decades, the fossil fuels are going to stay ahead until, unless we are willing to actually price greenhouse gases. Are we going to price greenhouse gases? Well, let me leave you with a final alternative. And this is what I think we are going to act. This is where the debate, I bet, will go in the next four or five years. And that is, you're going to hear a lot about mitigation versus adaptation. Should we really try to deal with this greenhouse gas problem, or is it already too late and we should just start adapting? And what scares me is that there are going to be some very strong voices for adaptation on the grounds that that's doable and mitigation isn't. That is, adaptation is certainly where we're going as long as we don't do anything, because we're, what we're going to end up doing is simply piecemeal changes to try to deal with climate change. And of course, the very first order change is we're all going to turn our air conditioners up so that we are burning more fossil fuels in order to keep our houses cool. That's a form of adaptation. Now, then we're going to have to start building some dikes, and we're going to have to start moving the population. And that's going to be very costly, but it can be done locally. It doesn't require international treaties. And that's what's really scary, because I think that will turn out to be the default. That will turn out to be the path of political least resistance. If you, a politician is running for office, and I, I have spent a lot of time ragging on politicians who don't have the spine to propose a $2 gas tax or a major, chain, a major price for greenhouse gases, but the fact is we get the politicians we vote for. 
And the reasons they don't have the spine to propose it is the reason John Kerry in 2004 ran as hard as he could away from the fact that back in 1993 he supported a 50 cent a gallon gas tax because he knew he would lose the election. And the problem is if you ask, if you tell people we're going to solve the problem, the problem the voters are going to see is the fact that there is seawater encroachment, the fact that there are hurricanes, the fact they are going to say, well, there's this invisible gas up there that we got to do something about. Adaptation is a much more tangible response than mitigation is. And I think that will make it also a much stronger political selling point. And in the end, I think it's going to be a real challenge for the American political system because I think in the end that's not the ethical response to the greenhouse gas problem we face, to the climate change problem, but it will be the politically most feasible response. And my model that I've just presented is a great forecaster of the last decade. I hope it won't turn out to be a great forecaster of the next decade. Thank you very much. What I'm going to talk about is, is kind of a um, small part of the puzzle about what we can do now. Um, and we'll hear a lot about um, things that can happen in the future to drive, uh, drive improvements. And I'm going to tell you about car companies. Um, I've got to know car companies over the last 10 years because we make things and sell things to car companies. And even if what you sell to a car company is fantastically valuable and a no-brainer, it takes 10 years for them to put it on the vehicle. So I'm going to just go through that part of the equation a little bit, and hopefully it won't be too much like bad news by the end of the day. So basically, I'm going to talk about a technology as something that is here and now. We like science. Science is something that isn't commercial. Technology is something that is commercial. I'll just get that face straightforward a definition right there. And what I'll talk about is some of the implications of things that can change on vehicles to get better fuel economy and low emissions that are worthwhile going through because we just heard, and it's true, most of the oil is, is um, you know, 55, 60 percent of the oil is, is used on vehicles. And so let's find a better way to really uh, save those. But let's be aware of the full set of consequences that goes along with that. So successful technology is a commercial. It's not something in the future. That's called science. And so I have a very simple understanding of technology as something that's commercial now. Not by incentives, not by tax breaks, not by subsidies, but really commercial as in payback, as in the consumer or the business can see the value right, right here. And so I'll paint a picture of what can happen now only it's probably 10 years away because the car companies take forever to do anything, even if it's really simple. That, that can really set in motion some major impact, which is positive. And I'll talk about some of the environmental um, aspects of that. And we have to understand the effects of different types of powertrains on the environment. People tend to focus on CO2 as the only emission. Well, actually, there are much more dangerous emissions to our health right now at the ground level, like NOx and CO, that we have to be worried about with any new type of powertrain. So my favorite two characters are the saviors of the next 10 to 20 years. And these are gentlemen from the 1850s and 60s, where they were the, the new technologists. And what I'm saying is the next 10 to 20 years to bridge to the future is dependent on these two guys. And this is Otto and Diesel. And their technology and the technology that was developed because of their inventions in the next 50 or 60 years after the 1850s and 60s um, is really at the heart of the improvement we can drive that's just right at hand now, that's really commercial. So these, these guys are the drivers of our solution. It's not... Um, quite as exciting and, and sort of sexy as you'd think, but these guys are the saviors of the human race. Discuss. <laughs> okay, let's talk about fuel efficiency in a fairly localized sense. And this isn't doing some very um, clever sort of well-to-wheel analysis. This is just saying we could start driving a, a European diesel vehicle right now that can go at 
250 kilometers an hour, I know because I try it occasionally over there, that, can, that has about 50% better fuel efficiency um, than we drive now. So to put in better terms, we could uh, double the fuel efficiency by simply using currently available technology that's available in Germany. And the Germans, eight to 10 years ago, they couldn't believe they were ever gonna use diesels. They were stinky, they were slow, they were expensive. And they can't buy them fast enough now. Why? Because of their fuel efficiency and they're fast. That exists now. That's not an incentive driving that. That's a payback. So my friends in London and the UK buy diesels because in two years it pays back. And these things last for 15 years. And in the UK, fuel is the same price, whether it's diesel or gasoline. So they all buy diesels. There's no incentive there to buy diesels. They do so because it makes sense, because of the fuel efficiency, and also there's less CO2. These are simple things that um, can happen and are happening throughout the world. You can go further, of course. You can have diesel hybrids, and you can have a diesel hybrid with a much lighter body we hear from, from the earlier speakers and have fuel efficiencies that are three or four times where we are currently in the States. And these are things that are real right now. And now for the bad news, I suppose it has to be a bad news story, is that there are massive emissions problems. And I don't mean CO2 emissions problems. There are massive emission problems with diesels. And the things called soot particles, and there's, there's something called NOx. And between those two things, there's an awful problem to be solved, but it can be solved. If you've been to Paris in any summer in the last five to 10 years, you'll be struggling with the definition of Paris as the, a city of light, as a city of smog and of soot particles. So in France, they, they sell you know, maybe one out of two vehicles is a diesel, and there's no filter on these uh, diesel vehicles. So the pollution in Paris, because of the diesel vehicle, is extremely hazardous and is very clear to anyone visiting uh, that wonderful city. So there's implications of these fuel-saving uh, systems that are really uh, present now, that are very commercial now, that we have to be aware of to look at the total, or at least a more of a total impact of these types of solutions. And so any diesel engine, the cost of the compliance and the cost of the emissions control is a, a major part of the equation, uh, and it's not trivial. And this is a a sort of slightly complex um, map, so I'll try and walk you through it. Uh, advance the slide would help. So the green curve is the engine out, um, NOx and PM. PM is, is the soot, a particle matter, and, no and NOx on the x-axis, and this is the engine out. Well, in the US, you need to get this little box in the bottom left-hand corner, and that presents a big challenge in terms of cost, in terms of being able to control the NOx from a diesel engine, and the soot particles to go from en engine out emissions uh, to what comes out of the tailpipe. And it's this kind of problem that's been really dogging this, this whole powertrain solution, much better fuel efficiency, much slower CO2 emissions, that, that has really driven the fact that there's very few diesels in the States and they're still struggling even now with the next three or four years to try and get these vehicles to comply with the US EPA standards. Now in Europe, of course, they managed the soot um, soot levels that they had to meet very carefully to encourage the use of diesels because of the fuel efficiency and because car companies signed up to a set of a CO2 limits that they said they'd try and meet, which they're not meeting, but, but they're trying to. So it's a very different approach in the States where they've been very harsh on the uh, local emissions, which are very dangerous, like NOx and soot particles. And they really shut the door to diesels, basically. And, and that's going to start to change as catalyst companies like ourselves and other people invent devices to control these things so that the U.S. can benefit from this current, um, currently available technology. And just, just a good example on the NOx side, there's various things you can do to control NOx, and this is, this is a, a quick sample of different NOx solutions which have different amounts of fuel penalty. But why, why do these things have fuel penalty? You put a big thing on an exhaust pipe, it tends to restrict the engine flow right there, and you tend to drive up the, the uh, uh, fuel use um, very quickly. The other thing is that people are using fuel from, from the fuel management system to try and get these NOx reactions to occur on board, and so there's that fuel penalty baked in. But there's some good solutions. Um, the ones in the top right are pretty, 
are widely available. They're used in Germany and parts of Europe currently in terms of heavy diesel. And at the moment, people like Daimler and a VW are fighting the EPA to try and get these technologies allowed to meet NOx standards here. And this is make or break. No one talks about this. This is make or break. Will the EPA allow this kind of technology to be on vehicles? You'll have a tank of this stuff underneath the vehicle. You'll be able to meet the NOx standards and have a clean diesel. Then the US can benefit from the massive fuel efficiency that's right there available now. It feels like the tail wagging the dog with the catalyst company and the EPA seem to um, have a big effect on, on what happens. And it's, it's, it's wrong, but that's the way things are. So really the catalyst and the auto treatment system is a key driver in the fuel efficiency that's already available in terms of lowering CO2 levels. And um, that's the kind of total picture you need to look at. And people talk about diesel being available. It is, but certain things have to be done in the next three or four years. But it is just around the corner. We could move, move to a situation in the States as fast as Germany did when it brought in these clean diesels over a space of five to ten years. To be 2015, we could have a massive rollout of diesels in this country. A few emissions problems to solve, and the fuel use by the country will go down massively right there. That's not new technology. That's technology that's available now throughout the world. So that's part of, I think that's a good news message there. It's good news for the catalyst companies, of course, but it's also good news for the consumer to have those choices of different types of vehicle. Because they'll buy diesels. But they do in the UK because it makes sense. There's, there's a clear commercial payback. And they're faster. So if you look at a slightly broader picture, and a different people have different sort of well-to-wheel sort of -well scenarios, of course, you know, there's a whole scale of things that can happen. And if you look at the CO2 implied in, in a, some kind of biofuel, the good news is that you can have a diesel coming into the, the, the states with a massive fuel efficiency impact with current fuel. But that platform can then be upgraded by using biofuels from different types of technology to gain a much bigger gain in terms of total, total cycle a CO2 benefit. And so the diesel platform and then the diesel hybrid platform coming in can be enhanced further by the biofuel a surge that is happening within the country, within the world. And so this is really becoming and looking then like a very solid bridging technology to start to, to, to use much less fuel in terms of the, the sort of light vehicle segment, um, both in the States and also throughout the world. So just to sum up, I think I've, uh, I've, I've mentioned most of these points. Uh, the key thing is to look at the impacts of conservation. Conservation is the key. Diesel technology, that, that chap in the 1850s that invented the diesel cycle, so-called, is the key. And we will solve the emissions problems, and that will then open the door to a very rapid to a rollout of those kinds of powertrains in the US. And just a small, a small increase in efficiency will will start to make the current base of a refinery capacity look to be a lot more sensible than it is at the moment, and that's from a, a um, DOE study. My second example, just a kind of quick one, is the other big user of fossil fuels, certainly um, natural gas and coal, is the power gen industry. And two, two key things that we know here that don't need to be invented. One is that we waste most of the heat. There are things called cogen, large centralized power stations that try and recover the heat. But it's very hard to match that heat output with some local user. And how do you transport the heat to where it's needed? A GE have invented a new turbine that's 45% efficient, a symbol cycle, which is eight percentage points better than the previous symbol cycle turbine. That's, that's amazing. You're still wasting all the heat. And there's a lot of heat that goes out of the stack. So that's one key thing we know. The other thing we know is that we spend a lot of energy moving it from, from the centralized power stations to the homes. So those two things are quite in front of us. This isn't new technology. This is just facts about what we can do. So what I'm going to talk about is a, a quite a radical concept. It's going back hundreds of yeah, 100 years or so, and people, before the kind of grid situation was, was built, um, people couldn't use the grid, they had to make, make local power and local heat. And obviously you can get 80, 85 percent efficiency if, if you use the heat from a, a fossil fuel power gen source and also the electricity is, is sort of part of that. The UK is trying to move to 10,000 megawatts of a cogen by the year 
uh, 2010. That's the sense that you probably have of it's just around the corner, which is a huge portion of its, of its uh, power generation. The reason why they're excited about that is the heat part of the equation that's very local is going to be generated by small and mid-sized uh, small and mid-sized cogen units. So if you move cogen from the centralized mode where it's silly to the localized mode, you can start to get these kinds of efficiencies. Slight detail about the emissions again. You've got a, some kind of engine in your backyard now making electricity in the heat with fantastic efficiency. You do need a catalyst to stick on there to clean the emissions, but that's a very trivial indeed. Just a plug for some, for some cogen companies. I have no shares in these companies, by the way. Um, I, I wish I did. Um, but you could simply have something underneath your a kitchen cabinet or in the backyard producing massive amounts of power and heat, and you can obviously feed, feed the power back onto the grid. Again, current technology. The old combustion engine, those guys, Otto and Diesel, are still laughing because this is the next 20 or 30 years of, of not wasting heat and not a wasting the power that has to be lost to bring it into to homes. A good use of Chevy 454 V8 engines. Um, so, this is a, a, just a few conclusions. So, there's my picture of uh, the famous cogen unit. Sorry, I wasn't actually scrolling the slides through of my a company that I don't have shares in. And this is a simple unit that does about 70 a kilowatts. Um, and so, the payback is actually quite, quite good on these units. You have about a 70% reduction in, in the cost of electricity. You take about half of that cost saving to pay for the natural gas and the maintenance. It's still a very good break even. Your two to three year payback. That's, the, that's what I mean by commercial. Um, and no incentives are involved in, in that kind of equation. So just to conclude, uh, there are technologies now that are available. We have to save energy. We have to save fuel. We need to bridge the future where we can start to bring in the new real technologies. How do we do that? We do that with things that are here and now. The car companies can't move that quickly, and they're the big users. Start moving into diesel. You can maybe get, get diesel on the ground in the States, 30 or 40% penetration by 2015, if, you start, you know, if things start moving now to solve the emissions problems. It's quite simple. So these, these, these things are at hand, and they're really commercial, and it's part of really stretching out the current resources to get us in position to use the new technologies, lowering CO2 emissions. Good news story. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, talk about some technological solutions to uh, climate protection that are profitable, business-led. In the spirit of Raymond Williams' remark that to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not despair convincing. Uh, <clears throat> so let me start with the riddle of why is climate protection like the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, they were both messed up by a sign error. Someone mixed up a plus and a minus sign. Uh, the political debate around climate protection is all about who will uh, bear the costs, burdens, and sacrifices this is presumed to require. And yet there's a parallel universe of practitioners, all of whom make money on climate protection. If these two universes ever meet and we discover that climate protection is actually about profits, jobs, and competitive advantage, that will make the politics very much simpler uh, <coughs> and obviate the uh, dilemma that Fred Severin just talked about. Uh, now, whether or not one believes climate change is a problem, smart companies are racing to solve it in order to make money. For example, two of our biggest chip makers in the world have been cutting their carbon emissions 6% a year with typically two or three year paybacks on retrofits. DuPont set an ambitious goal of, uh, by 2010, cutting its energy use per dollar of product 6% every year uh, while shifting substantially to renewables uh, for both energy and feedstocks and cutting their greenhouse gas emissions by 65% below the 1990 level. That sounds awfully hard. How are they doing? Well, by 2004, they, they were 72 percent below the 1990 level. Uh, they were producing 30 percent more product with 7 percent less energy, and they made $2 billion profit on the deal. By uh, 2006, that was an 80 percent saving below 1990, and they made $3 billion profit on the deal, because efficiency is cheaper than fuel. 
BP similarly met its goal for operational carbon reductions eight years early at they bashfully said no net cost, so I probed a little and they uh, eventually admitted they'd made $650 million profit by substituting efficiency for fuel. That's now $1.6 billion. Interface has cut its uh, <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions in absolute terms by over half, two-thirds of it through energy efficiency, uh, very lucratively, and uh, that's a rate of uh, GHG reduction of nearly 8 percent a year. TI, Texas Instruments, is just commissioning a new chip fab we helped design that uh, is built in Texas, not China, because we cut $220 million out of the capital cost while saving a fifth of the energy and a third of the water. The next one will probably save over half the energy and cost even less to build. So while the politicians continue to lament and debate costs, uh, <coughs> the smart companies are racing to get to the profits before their competitors do. Uh, now, we don't actually need a great deal of this activity to have a big effect. Uh, economic theorists normally assume that the energy intensity of the economy, how much primary energy we use per dollar of GDP, uh, will continue to drop by about 1 percent a year worldwide. But if that were 2 percent a year, CO2 emissions would level off. And if it were roughly 3 percent a year, it would drop fast enough to stabilize the Earth's climate uh, near as we can guess. Is, is 3 percent a year actually feasible? Well, in this country, we've been doing it uh, for in many periods of both high and low energy price uh, without even paying attention. And California has done consistently about one percentage point faster than that. So our new houses here are four times more efficient than they were 30 years ago, and we're still saving a great deal more. Uh, China has done uh, for over 20 years over 5 percent a year reduction in energy intensity from, of course, a very inefficient base. And for four years, they did nearly 8 percent a year. Then they came off the rails with the new construction boom, but probably this year they'll get back on track. Uh, they are the only country for which the top priority in development strategy is energy efficiency. And attentive companies, some of whom I've just listed, routinely save 6 or 8 percent a year. Uh, so what's so hard about three? And since everybody up here made money doing efficiency instead of uh, burning fuel, why should 3 percent a year even cost anything instead of profiting us? Now, it turns out that in this country, over half of our oil and gas and over three-quarters of our electricity can be saved at below the short-run marginal cost of producing it and delivering it from existing capacity. Uh, even Japan, which in aggregates looks like the most energy efficient country, uh, can profitably save about two-thirds of its energy, according to a very good engineer who's president of Tokyo University. I think he's right. Um, so noting that two-fifths of the CO2 emissions from fossil fuel come from burning oil and another two-fifths from running power plants with almost no overlap between the two, uh, let me talk in turn about those two. And the other bits are directly used coal and gas that follow very similar principles. In September 2004, my team published uh, a, an independent, <coughs> detailed, peer-reviewed, transparent, and so far unargued with roadmap called Winning the Oil Endgame, co-sponsored by the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Chief of Naval Research, and written for business and military leaders around competitive strategy for cars, trucks, planes, oil, and military. You can get the whole thing and its two dozen technical annexes free at oilendgame.com. And its thesis is that <clears throat> by the 2040s, the U.S. can have eliminated its use of oil altogether uh, and revitalized its economy, led by business for profit. Uh, <clears throat> so the transition could look like this. The official projections show oil use and oil imports rising towards the northeast corner, these red lines. But we showed how to turn those curves down along the green lines by redoubling the efficiency of using oil. We've already doubled it since 75, but we can double it again at an average cost of $12 a barrel in year 2000 dollars. And we, <coughs> we can then <coughs> turn down even more steeply along the blue lines by replacing the other half of the oil with a combination of saved natural gas and advanced biofuel, mainly cellulosic ethanol, 
at an average cost of $18 a barrel. So the average of 12 and 18 is 15 bucks a barrel. That's what it costs not to use the oil, but do the same things, the same or better. And the difference between 15 and whatever oil price uh, is, is potential profit, assuming that externalities are worth zero, a uh, conservatively low estimate. Now, we know this sort of thing can be done because we did it before. Notice how steeply oil use and imports dropped the last time we paid attention from 1977 to 85. In those eight years, GDP grew 27 percent, oil use fell 17 percent, oil imports fell by half, imports from the Persian Gulf fell by 87 percent, and they would have been gone in one more year if we'd kept that up. In fact, oil use and oil imports fell so much, OPEX exports dropped by half, and it broke their pricing power for a decade because we customers, especially in America, the Saudi Arabia of mega barrels, had more market power than the oil supply cartel. Our power was on the demand side. We could save oil faster than they could conveniently sell less oil. Uh, that was practice. This is real. You are here. But we could run that play all over again much better with today's much more powerful technologies. Uh, well, suppose that over the next 18 years, we invested $180 billion once. That's about what we spend on oil every half year. And we invested half of it in retooling the car, truck, and plane industries and half of it in building a modern biofuels industry. Uh, <clears throat> and suppose that the oil we thereby didn't buy were priced at 26 bucks a barrel, the official forecast of three years ago, uh, which might actually be about right if we did what I'm describing. Uh, <clears throat> in which case, that $180 billion investment would be saving $155 billion a year gross, $70 billion a year net, a very handsome return. The American CO2 emissions as a free byproduct would drop by 26 percent. We'd get a million new jobs, three quarters of them in rural and small town America. That's the biofuels part. And we would get to save a million jobs now at risk, mainly in automaking, where we have a really simple choice. Do we continue importing efficient cars to displace oil, or do we make efficient cars and import neither the oil nor the cars? We found in an American context this could actually all be done without new fuel taxes, subsidies, mandates, federal laws, or anything else that either party doesn't like or could mess up. Uh, because we're not relying here on public policy to force people to commit unnatural acts in the marketplace, but rather uh, on a very compelling competitive strategy case for the businesses concerned to t take us on this journey beyond oil for their own reasons. Uh, and, as I'll describe, that is actually underway. Now, the, the core of it, <coughs> is, technologically, is transport, which uses 70 percent of the oil. The other 30 percent goes to buildings and industry where there are big, cheap savings, often with lower capital cost. But we looked with particular care at cars, trucks, and planes and found that they could become three times as efficient as the official forecast for 2025, with all the same attributes, only safer. With respect to paybacks of two years, one year, and four or five years at U.S. fuel prices. Uh, and the trick is to make them ultra lightweight, uh, ultra low drag, <coughs> and use advanced propulsion systems like hybrids. Uh, by the way, all these technologies continue to improve much faster than we use them up, and much faster than the stunning advances already mentioned by, by Paul in finding and lifting oil. Uh, and therefore, efficiency is an ever bigger, cheaper resource to an extent that even many specialists fail to appreciate. Uh, also, you often get better performance. For example, here's a, uh, a two-seat carbon uh, diesel hybrid Eco Sportster from Opel. It does 150 miles an hour and 94 miles a gallon, although not at the same instant. Uh, <laughs> And one of the surprises for many is that the ultralighting that makes these carbon fiber concept cars twice as efficient does not actually increase production cost using new manufacturing methods because the cost of their materials are paid for by simpler automaking and a smaller propulsion system. So saving 69% of the fuel in cars and light trucks, for example, is like buying gasoline for 57 cents a gallon. Uh, now, to see how to do this, <coughs> we just have to... Uh, ask where your gasoline goes. Your car uses every day about 100 times its weight in ancient plants, but seven-eighths of that fuel energy never gets to the wheels. It's lost first in the engine, idling, driveline, and accessories. Of the one-eighth that does 
make it to the wheels, half of that either heats the tires and road or heats the air that the car is pushing aside, and only the last 6% actually accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. But since only 5% of the mass you're accelerating is you and the other 95% is the car, this means that only 5% of 6% or 0.3% of the fuel energy actually ends up moving the driver. This is not very gratifying after 120 years of devoted engineering effort. <laughs> However, fortunately, three-fourths of the fuel use, both the acceleration term and the uh, rolling resistance term, are caused by the car's weight. And every unit of fuel we can save at the wheels will save an additional seven units we don't need to waste getting it to the wheels. So there's enormous leverage in making the car radically lighter weight. Uh, <clears throat> well, here's a, uh, an uncompromised mid-sized suburban assault vehicle that we designed seven years ago with a couple of European tier ones that illustrates this principle. Uh, it would be made out of uh, carbon fiber composites weighing altogether uh, less than half as much as an equivalent steel car, but safer even if they hit each other. Uh, quite brisk acceleration, and the original design used a fuel cell to do 114 miles a gallon. Later on, we did a variant with a gasoline hybrid like a Prius at 67 miles a gallon. That's about three and a half times more efficient than the steel equivalent, but at only two and a half thousand dollars higher retail price, which we ascertained by actual bids at about a 500 line item level of detail from the supply chain. Uh, and that would be a nine-month payback at European or 22-month payback at U.S. fuel prices. Uh, and th part of the attraction of this approach <clears throat> is the way it's made. You notice there are only uh, 14 parts in the body. In fact, it looks kind of like an airframe. It's suspended from rings not built up from a tub, which is our horse and buggy legacy of how we make cars. So it's very light, strong, and stiff. Now these 14 parts can each be lifted with one hand and no hoist. In fact, the heaviest part, this side, I, I've lifted with one finger. Uh, and each part is made with one low pressure die set. A steel body takes 10 or 20 times more parts, each with four uh, steel stamping die sets. So that's about a 99% saving on tooling cost. Then these composite parts uh, snap precisely together for gluing, kind of like a kid's toys. So you don't need jigs, robots, and welders to hold them in place and fit them together. Therefore, no body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, there's no paint shop. So there went the two hardest and costliest parts of making the car. And the total capital needed drops by at least two-fifths below the leanest plant in the industry. I actually brought a little sample along for a uh, what is now a properly shaped helmet that we're shipping from a little firm I chair in this field, uh, just to show you that plastics have changed since the graduate. And this stuff is tougher than titanium and extraordinarily light. You may have seen a film in which Tom Friedman tries real hard to bash this with a sledgehammer, but it bounces off. Uh, <clears throat> and we can now make these aerospace grade composites at automotive cost and speed. So. Think of this as like finding a Saudi Arabia under Detroit. Uh, it's even better than the one in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and it doesn't run out. It's over 8 million barrels a day. So basically, by making cars and light trucks out of the stuff, you lose half the weight and half the fuel. It gets safer because this absorbs 12 times the crash energy of steel per kilogram, uh, and it costs the same to make the car. Now, on the supply side, uh, I am not talking about corn ethanol, which is a rather small and costly and heavily subsidized resource, although it's improving, but rather cellulosic ethanol made of woody, weedy stuff like switchgrass and poplar and crop waste, forestry waste, which gives you twice the yield with less investment and up to eight times better net energy yield um, with some left over to displace petrochemicals. And these technologies are coming on very nicely. Uh, just to illustrate the maturation of the sector, Brazil uh, has replaced a quarter of its gasoline energy already uh, with sugarcane ethanol competitive without subsidy. Uh, they got their initial startup subsidy back over 50 times over from the oil savings. Uh, Sweden has a good policy uh, that I hope the new government will keep to get off oil by 2020 through cellulosic ethanol mainly from the forest sector. Um, Europe is a much bigger producer than we are of biodiesel as part of a strategy to shift farmers 
from subsidy to durable revenue, and over half that product is actually sold by oil companies. Here's how the moving parts fit together in the U.S. Instead of needing 28 million barrels a day of petroleum products in 2025, we could displace almost seven of that with efficiency costing an average of 12 bucks a barrel by then and still be in the process of saving another seven as we complete the slow turnover of the vehicle fleets. We would get almost six from biofuels and the like, uh, almost two from no-brainer substitutions of saved natural gas. We can save half our gas at about an eighth the recent price, very straightforwardly. And then we would get almost eight of forecast domestic production from areas already allowed and still need five from someplace else. Where could we get that? Well, maybe we should buy more efficiency, it's so cheap, or wait a little longer and get the rest of it that we're still working on at that point. Or we could, of course, continue to buy oil from, say, Canada and Mexico. And by then, the WTO will have made us drop our illegal 100% tariff on Brazilian ethanol, let that in, they'd love to sell it to us. Oh, but I haven't yet accounted for most of the saved natural gas. And it turns out that's enough if directly substituted to fill the rest of this oil balance. Or if even more uh, profitably we were to make it into hydrogen, which you can use a lot more efficiently than oil uh, or direct gas, then you could also displace the domestic oil this way. And I haven't counted other options. For example, just in the Dakotas, there's enough very windy available land to make cost-effectively by then, enough wind power to make enough hydrogen, 50 megatons a year, to run every highway vehicle in the country at these levels of efficiency. Uh, now, we're busy implementing this through a, a quiet little effort at our institute I'll let you in on. We call it institutional acupuncture. We figure out where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We stick needles in it to get it flowing. Uh, we need to flip the behavior of six sectors, and I'd say we're past the uh, tipping point already on three. Uh, one is aviation, where Boeing is beating Airbus with an efficiency leapfrog strategy based on advanced composites. Uh, heavy trucks, where Walmart has already demanded from its suppliers doubled efficiency trucks, and uh, we're broadening the buyer's consortium and speeding innovation in that sector. And then they'll go to triple efficiency, which is a 60% internal rate of return and military, which is just now emerging as the federal leader in getting the nation off oil, so they needn't fight over it. They could, they could have mega missions in the Gulf, mission unnecessary. They really like that idea. We're coming along nicely in the fuel and finance sectors. The slow one, as expected, is light vehicles, but they're starting to change. You may notice that the new head of Ford Motor Company was the head of Boeing Commercial Airplanes. So he was leading that successful competitive leapfrog to a one-fifth more efficient, same cost, better airplane uh, half of which is advanced composites to make it ultra light, and they're now rolling that out throughout their whole line of airplanes. So he's moved now to Ford with that cultural DNA, knowledge of how to do it, and transformational intent, strongly supported by the United Auto Workers and the dealers who correctly feel that basic innovation is the only way to save this industry. So what's going on in automaking is what Schumpeter called creative destruction. Uh, and it's really opening minds, you know, gazing into the abyss does concentrate the mind wonderfully, uh, not to mention potential leapfroggers and uh, new market entrants. So the, the competition in this sector is at such a fundamental level that it's going to change the manager's minds or the managers, whichever comes first. Uh, watch this space. Yesterday I was keynoting an automotive summit in uh, L.A., and uh, there's some very interesting conversations going on that you would not have heard a year ago. Now. You can go even beyond what I've described. I mean, j just an excellent hybrid like a Prius, properly driven, not the way Consumer Report says to drive it, will roughly double your efficiency. Uh, more with new diesels. And 11 days ago was tested the first digital engine, which looks about half again as efficient as a diesel burning any fuel on the fly and needing no cleanup to meet very stringent air quality standards. Uh, and. Uh, other interesting advantages, including lower cost. Now, if you ultralight your hybrid and clean up some other details, you roughly redouble its efficiency. If you were to burn 85% ethanol in it, you would quadruple again your oil efficiency per kilometer, and you could put carbon back in the soil where it belongs and pay farmers for doing that. A good plug-in hybrid, and those are coming at us fast, could at least redouble fuel efficiency again, substituting a modest amount of electricity, and it could be attractive uh, if you 
have smart ways to sell the distributed electric storage function to the grid when and where it's most valuable. That may pay for the expensive batteries. Uh, <clears throat> and so far, if you add all this up, or actually multiply it, you just saved 97 percent of the oil per kilometer. So yeah, you could do hydrogen as well, and there are smart ways to do it that are quite attractive if you start with efficient vehicles, but you don't really need to in order to save most of the oil. Now, let me turn to electricity, the other two-fifths of the CO2 problem. Uh, back in the late 80s, we looked at the measured cost and performance data for about 1,000 electricity saving technologies and concluded that if they were thoroughly retrofitted where practical, they'd save about three quarters of U.S. electricity at an average cost that in today's dollars would be about one cent a kilowatt hour. Uh, the utilities think tank uh, found it was more like a 40 to 60 percent saving, not 75, at a somewhat higher cost, still below short run marginal delivered price. Uh, but it turns out the difference between those two assessments was methodological rather than substantive. I don't care who's right. They're both very big numbers. And there have been similar, very detailed findings in rather efficient European countries. And the savings, as EPRI will agree, keep getting bigger and cheaper faster than we're using them up. Uh, and efficiency can work quickly. 10 million people in Southern California in the early 80s we're cutting the uh, Edison 10-year head forecast of peak load by 8.5% every year at about 1% the cost of making more electricity. In, in 1990, the big uh, utility group in New England was, uh, had, had signed up 90% of a small business uh, retrofit pilot program in just two months. Meanwhile, uh, in the San Francisco area, PG&E signed up a quarter of new commercial buildings uh, for design improvements in three months. And then they said, oh, that's too easy. Let's raise the bar. So they did, and they got all of the bigger target next year in the first nine days of January. So we really got pretty good at marketing this stuff. And we have lately had about uh, six years of consistent reduction in electric intensity for the first time in this country. Uh, <clears throat> but. Um, we have even better delivery methods now, as well as technologies. Now we don't just market megawatts, but we can make markets in megawatts, so we get the most competition in who saves and how to keep driving the savings and quality up and the cost down. But I want to go a lot further in suggesting what's important is not just great technologies, but new ways to combine them. So if you were to come visit my house at 7,100 feet in the Rockies, uh, where you can get frost any day of the year, it can go to minus 47F, you can get 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. You'd come into this central atrium, and uh, it looks like this a year ago, uh, and you'd find we've harvested 28 banana crops with no heating system. Why not? Well, I didn't need one, and it was cheaper up front not to put it in. And with the save money plus another 16 bucks a square meter, uh, I saved also 99% of the water heating energy and 90% of the household electricity and half the water, all with a 10-month payback with 1983 technology. Now we can do a lot better. Here's a, um, a, a typical tract house uh, near in, in uh, Davis, and at 113 or 115 F in Stanford Ranch, uh, in a PG&E experiment in the 90s, we showed that you could actually save about uh, four-fifths of the uh, normal California energy allowed at that time for such a house and make it cheaper to build. Uh, or in Bangkok, a really difficult climate, here's a nice modern house built at exactly normal cost uh, using a tenth of normal air conditioning energy to provide superior comfort. So here we span the range of the Earth's climates, and the basic story is the same. We optimize the house as a system not the windows or insulation or whatever as a component. And we optimize for multiple benefits. Now, in economic theory, we keep hearing of diminishing returns, that the more energy you save, the more and more steeply the cost of the next unit of savings goes up until it gets too expensive and you have to stop. But in those houses and many other cases, sure, at first I see diminishing returns as I add insulation to my house. That's how insulation works. But when I put in enough insulation, I don't need the heating system anymore. Guess what? I saved the whole capital cost of the furnace, uh, fans, ducts, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, fuel supply arrangements, because I don't need them anymore. And that saved me more capital than I invested to get rid of them. So I end up saving 99% of the space heating energy, and the house costs less to build by about $1,100 in those days. 
Well, why should we get there the long way around when we can tunnel through the cost barrier to that destination? Or consider a pumping example. Pumps are the biggest user of electricity uh, for motors, and motors use three-fifths of all the electricity in the world. Well, <clears throat> we had a case where uh, the top, I believe, German firm had, in a certain industry, had optimized a, a runaround loop for heat transfer to use 70.8 kilowatts. A Dutch colleague redesigned it to use 5.3 kilowatts, which is 92% less. It cost less to build, it worked better in every way, just by using fat, short, straight pipes rather than skinny, long, crooked pipes. This is not rocket science. This is good Victorian engineering rediscovered. And then we found that we'd left a factor four on the table. We should have saved about 98% by counting seven more benefits. You start to see how you can save a lot of electricity this way. And it's, it's particularly nice when you go all the way downstream. I mean, you can feed about, say, 10 units of coal into a classical power plant, lose two thirds of it there, lose more in the wires, more in all the conversion, in order to get one unit, a tenth as much, of flow out of the pipe. So turn those compounding losses around backwards. It's just like the car example. You save another 10 units of coal you don't need to waste getting it to the pipe, so to speak. In other words, every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe will save 10 units of coal and pollution and global weirding back at the power plant. Huge leverage. And also, as you go back upstream, the equipment gets smaller, simpler, and cheaper, so your capital cost goes down. So that's why you always start savings downstream, which is not the way most designers do it. It's not that difficult. For example, often you go into a factory or a big building, and you find a big pump that's supposed to send something up a pipe. And next to it is an identical in-place spare, because it's a very important pump. And they draw it like this, and they build it like this, so all the time the flow has to go through two right-angle bends and typically two valves. Why don't we do it this way with no bends and no valves or one valve? Well, just because we haven't done it that way before. But a great engineer uh, over in Oakland, Peter Rumsey, did that as a retrofit in the Oakland Museum. And he ended up, in this case, saving three-quarters of the pumping energy with these Y bends, sweet bends, you notice this pipe's running diagonally through the air. To do that, you tell the plumbers and pipe fitters to lay out the, the supply pipes as if they were drains, right? Because they got another part of their brain that knows that if drains have bends, they clog. Uh, and in this case, he also eliminated altogether 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance. Nega pumps are a really good kind. Uh, <clears throat> now, in our practice, uh, in private industry, we have lately redesigned about $30 billion worth of stuff. And, uh, you know, whether it's chip fabs, oil refineries, North Sea oil platform, a $5 billion gas to liquids plant, world's second biggest LNG plant, the world's biggest platinum mine, data center, supermarkets, chemical plants, a Navy cruiser, a luxury yacht, you name it. Typically, in retrofits, we'll end up saving 30 to 60 percent of the energy with a two or three year payback. In new installations, we save about 40 to 90 percent, and the capital cost almost always goes down, not up. So this, of course, takes some reforms in engineering practice and pedagogy. Go to 10xe.org to read about our plot. I hope you will join for the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering, because I'm sick and tired of retrofitting stuff that wasn't designed right. Obviously, if it were designed right, we couldn't do any of this. Uh, but we have now demonstrated tunneling through the cost barrier in 29 sectors, so we think it's real and generalizable, and we understand pretty well how to do it. Um, and actually, it works also at a macro level, even without those innovations in design, just by uh, better appliance and building efficiency standards and rewarding utilities for cutting your bills, not selling you more energy. California has held per capita use of electricity flat for 30 years while it kept going up in the rest of the country, and that has saved this state about $100 billion on power systems investment that could be, of course, and was more productively spent elsewhere. Now, I want to just comment briefly on a shock that's happened on the supply side of the electricity system. These are two graphs of actual data on the left of the vertical line and industry projections on the right uh, for micropower. Uh, the tanned part, the larger part, is cogeneration or combined heat and power, uh, two-thirds gas-fired, so it saves at least half the carbon compared to what it replaces. And the upper graph here is electricity produced in the world by micropower. The lower graph is capacity installed. Now the colored wedges underneath the cogen 
are distributed renewables, which were about a $38 billion market in 2005. That's all the renewables except big hydro. And in 2005, it turns out that these low carbon or no carbon sources of electricity, which we were just told won't be competitive for quite a while, uh, actually added four times as much output and 11 times as much capacity as, say, nuclear added. And they produced a sixth of the world's electricity and a third of the world's new electricity. In fact, in 13 industrial countries, they provided from a sixth to over half of all electricity. Uh, and this doesn't count electric savings, which were probably about as big, and they're even cheaper. Uh, so why is micropower winning? Why have micropower and megawatts together captured upwards of half the world market in electrical services while central thermal plants have less than half? Well, simple. This stuff is cheaper and has lower financial risk. That's why it's financed by private risk capital. There isn't a nuclear project on Earth that's financed by private risk capital. They're bought by central planners. This ought to tell us something. So to test this hypothesis that maybe micropower is getting bought like mad because it's cheaper, I updated the, the best U.S. empirical data on what it costs to make and deliver a kilowatt hour, or to save it, uh, from either remote resources, which require a delivery cost to get to your meter, and I picked a low one, uh, or on-site resources that are already delivered. Your actual costs may vary, but I've done the comparison in a way that is uh, favorable to central plants. And for those, I used the canonical MIT study of 2003, baking in the subsidies that the plants got in those days, and not counting the big reserve margin that they require. So a nuclear plant and then the delivery cost gets you to close to 10 cents a kilowatt hour delivered. Now the capital cost has gone up by already a fifth, so we add another cent. And if you had really big subsidies, it might come down here. Well, we do have really big subsidies for the next six units in this country, roughly equal to their entire capital cost, whereupon Standard & Poor's put out a couple of reports saying this would not materially improve the builder's credit ratings because the market is still concerned about the remaining risks. So I think this, the, even that enormous distortion will have roughly the same effect as defibrillating a corpse. It will jump, but it won't revive. Uh, <laughs> But if it did work, then you'd get down to roughly where a coal plant was, but then if you put a 100 bucket ton carbon tax on a coal plant, it would get up here, and similarly for a combined cycle gas plant. So the policymakers in Washington keep juggling the subsidies and taxes to try to get the answer they want, not noticing, however, that central thermal plants are all uneconomic. Look at what we could buy instead. For example, suppose you assume that wind power costs <coughs> uh, over twice as much as the cheapest plants have cost installed through 2005, but only the median going back to 99. And of course, costs have been falling rapidly during that period. And let's also firm the wind so it's fully dispatchable. You can have it whether the wind's blowing or not. So it's entirely comparable to the central thermal plants. Now, if you took away its production tax credit, it would be up here, but meanwhile, it keeps getting cheaper. And uh, there are a lot of other renewables that are clearly doing very well in the market as well. Combined heat and power, garden variety, or in buildings, making cooling as well, or with recovered waste heat is typically even cheaper. Cheapest of all, end use efficiency in commercial and industrial retrofits, or a bit more with residential, a bit less if you're really good at it. You get the idea. You can see why the stuff to the right of my cursor is what the market is mainly buying to meet new electrical service needs in the world, while the stuff to the left, the central thermal plants, are not doing so well. Uh, and this has an important implication for climate protection. I can spend about 10 cents to make and buy a new nuclear kilowatt hour, and that will displace one kilowatt hour of coal power. Sounds good. Trouble is, if I spent the same 10 cents buying cheaper stuff, I get more of it. That's what cheaper means. So I would actually displace 2 to 10 kilowatt hours of coal-fired generation with the same money. And if I don't do that, I'm making things worse. In other words, if climate's a problem, we need the most solution per dollar and the most solution per year. And that means investing judiciously, least cost, best buys first, and not indiscriminately. Now, there's always a risk that when you try to buy something, it won't work, you get a dry hole. But we had an experiment in California, 82 to 85, in which you, we had pretty f level playing field between ways to make and save electricity. And the result was that just in those four years, the utilities bought or were firmly offered 143% of their peak load in savings or 
uh, alternative supply, mostly renewable, and they had to cut off the bidding because otherwise in another year they would have had to shut down every fossil and nuclear plant in the state, which, you know, in hindsight might not have been such a bad idea. And these resources are also huge, whether it's efficiency or cogen or wind, which in this country has over twice the potential. We need to meet all our electric needs, same in China, six times in the UK, nine times worldwide, other renewables even bigger. And the variability that Severn referred to is actually not a significant issue if properly integrated into the grid. And the reason is we've already bought more backup than we need for that in order to cope with the intermittence of the big thermal stations. So I think the collapse of nuclear power in the market is a very good thing for climate protection because you can get more protection per dollar and per year and huge macroeconomic leverage in funding other needs instead. And you also in inhibit the spread of nuclear bombs by taking away the innocent looking civilian disguise uh, and the ingredients of do-it-yourself bomb kits. The way to get there is to take markets seriously, not literally, and let all ways to save or produce energy compete fairly, no matter which kind they are, what they are, where they are, how big they are, or who owns them. This is pretty much the opposite of present energy policy, but I think such a market-based energy policy would make the oil and climate and proliferation problems go away, and we'd have a richer, fairer, more democratic, cooler, and safer world. So I'm grateful for your kind attention. We are, of course, the people we've been waiting for. Just remember Marshall McLuhan's remark, if this seems too good to be true. He said, only puny secrets need protection. Great discoveries are protected by public incredulity. But it's your move. Thank you.